Welcome to the Sport Exchange with me, John Robbie. Hi guys, welcome to the Sport Exchange podcast where we meet sporting personalities and learn about their lives and their life stories. Today, the Sport Exchange podcast meets a true South African sporting legend. He played for the Proteas with distinction for 15 years and holds almost every wicket-keeping record. Then, in a warm-up game against Somerset in 2012, it all ended literally in an instant. Welcome, Mark Boucher. Mark, nice talking to you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Joby. Thanks uh, for giving me the opportunity. Do you remember the incident? Very, very well. Um, up to the point where I think my legs were taken away from me on the field. Um and then, uh, yeah, I just closed my eyes and I just remember not, not wanting to open my eyes at all. Um, I knew that there was a, a bit of a problem when A.B. de Villiers walked up to me and I saw the, the sort of look on his face. And uh, he straight away, he turned to um, the physios off the field and the doctors off the field and said, you know, hurry up, get on the field. Um, and yeah, then I, I couldn't really see out of my left eye. Um, and I decided to close my right eye because I had quite a bit of a headache at that mm. stage. And then the next time I actually opened my eye was when the doctor um, looked at looked at it in the hospital, um, and he. The first thing I wanted to do was was maybe try get back onto um, onto the field to to play in my my next test match, uh, which was probably about a week's time. And I said to him, I said, Doc, am I, am I going to be okay for that next test match? And he sort of looked at me and said, No, Mark, I think this is uh, your time's up in the game of cricket. What did, I, What did you feel like at that moment? Like, I don't know. It's like someone had hit me in the stomach. Um, and uh, it, it was it was 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 one of those sort of moments where you you look back. I look back at it now, and and Tom seated, you know, when Tom stands still for a while. I remember going back to the room, and that's when the doctors were signing all the papers, and that I was, I was in my room by myself, and I remember looking out the mirror, well, out the out the window, and there was a little pigeon, that was was looking at me, and I. Somehow we we just come back from a, a trip to from Switzerland. Uh, we were on a preseason trip, um, and I remember speaking to a guy by the name of Mark Horn, who's an expeditionist. I know him very well. He's mad as a hatter. Yeah. And I, I sat with him. <laughs> Funny enough, I was the only guy sitting with him most of the nights, uh, having a glass of red wine. Whether it's just because I was interested in him, or just having a couple, of, enjoyed a couple of glasses of red wine. But he was telling me about all his stories uh, on his expeditions. We had uh, uh, faced uh, you know, the the doors of death. Mm. Um, with polar bears and, and with falling into water and all that type of stuff. And I sort of looked at that pigeon and I'll never forget it. I said, actually started talking to the pigeon. I said to him, listen, well, I'm not dead. That's what, I'm still alive. At least I've, I've still got another eye and, and I'm going to get through this. Um, my career might be finished. At that stage, you know, you, you don't really know. Can I, can I drive? Am I going to be able to run again? Am I going to be, most importantly, am I going to be able to play golf again? Yeah, of course. Because golf is a, is a big love of mine. Um, and I remember... As the doc came in, I said to him, I asked him all these questions, and he said, Mark, listen, you're going to be okay. You haven't lost a limb, so you're going to be okay. You, there are a lot of people that can can get through life with that, with one eye. You'll be surprised with your, how your body can actually adapt. Did the pigeon speak back to you? No, the pigeon <laughs> actually just flew away. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just one or two little funny things that happened that day. Um, obviously, when I had to break it to, the, to my teammates, yeah, um, it was one of the hardest things that I, I had to do. Um, thankfully, they took over for me and, and they announced it to the press. Can, can, you, can you see out of your left eye at all? Um, look, I've had about 13 op- ops in it. Um, yeah. And I've got a little bit of vision. Funny enough, if, uh, I do spend quite a bit of time uh, in nature and I, I use my binocs quite a bit. If I start playing around with my left-hand side, uh, then it does get a little bit clearer. Um, but the, the art takes a long time to heal. The doctors have just said to me, look, we did a proper job on it. Um, we just have to wait and see how science can, medical science can move forward and, and then make a decision whether to operate again to try to get some clarity out of it. Um, but it is very blurred at the moment. Uh, Jacques Callas always mocks me. He says, I, I paid quite a lot of money for uh, amount for my binoculars. He said, I sh- he said I should have got uh, monocular. <laughs> I'm wasting the other half, so I might have to cut them in half one I'm day gl- if I can't I'm, get the rest of the ice I'm glad down. humor still exists in, in in sport. Is it true that, I mean, it was Imran Taya bowled, he bowled a tail end batsman, the bail, did the ball hit the bail into your eyes? Is that what happened? Do we know? I, the bail, well, the bail bounced and, and hit, hit my eye um, and it went about two to three centimeters deep in. But I mean, did the um, ball knock it in like a hammer? Because surely a bale wouldn't do that on its own. The ball hit the bale and the bale f- sort of spun back into yeah. my eye. So it just, it was quite funny the way it actually happened um, because everything that was just going against me that day, I was wearing glasses, but then it started drizzling a bit. 
Um, and so I took my glasses, put them on top of my cap. We were basically just changing ends for Dale Stane. Um, so I didn't think that it was necessary to get a helmet on because yeah. usually I keep to Imran to here with a helmet. Um, but in the, on that particular day, I thought, I'll, I'll do one or two overs without a helmet. It's, it's not that serious. And then the guy just out of nowhere, he just took a, a bit of a swipe at it and it went, great delivery. He went through the gate and hit the top off stump where most coaches will say, you've got to try at the yeah, top off stump. Yeah. And he hit the top off stump and the bale just spun back and, and went straight into the eye. Were you prepared at all? Had you thought about life after cricket at that stage? Because life was just so good. You're such a... I mean, you seem to get better and better. You mentioned red wine. You were like good red wine. Yeah. You were getting better. You're a senior member of the team. You'd had issues in the past with with, with with your personality, so to speak. You'd been dropped. You'd come back. You'd learned lessons. We'll talk about that. But but where were you in terms of your your life journey before that moment? I think I was in a pretty good space. I think Gary Kirsten changed it all for me. Um I went to New Zealand and I had a good chat with him and he said to me, Bart, you know, you're not getting any, any younger um, and, you know, you deserve the right to, to maybe call it when you want to call it. Mm. Um, so let me know when you want to call it. So I said to him, well, Gaz, maybe England is the way to go. At that stage, uh, we were number two in the world. If we beat England in England, we would we'd go to number one. Um, if I'd have played all the test matches, my 150th test match would have been at Lord's. Wow. So it would have been the wow. perfect sort of ending for me. So yeah. I'd really trained hard. Um, I was probably the fittest I've ever been. Um, I was I was feeling very good at the bat with the gloves as well, knowing that England is quite a tough tour um, with both. Um, and we our team was just in a very good space. I've, I've, I felt that as one of the senior players that um, we could take on anyone. We didn't actually need a, a warm-up game. Hmm. Um, we were just very, very well gelled together, especially after that Switzerland trip. It was a really amazing pre-season trip. Um, you know, from a personal perspective, yeah, that, that was the plan, to, to play against England, um, you know, hopefully win the series, finish off at, at Lords, and end up number one. Yeah. Those all happened except for the 150, <laughs> uh, the 150 test matches and me being there. Um, yeah. But with the guys are very good. Um, I was on the couch actually watching the game at Lords when, when we ended up winning. And the first phone calls I got from the guys when they got back in the dressing room. And although I wasn't there, I honestly do feel, feel like they, they finished my career off for me that particular day. Are you bitter? Are you angry? Not at all. You must be a little bit. Not at all. Um, if I could have taken 147 test matches at the beginning of my career, I would have laughed at a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I would have said, there's no ways I'm going to play 147 test matches. So I've, I've been around the world. I've experienced a lot. I've had a lot of ups. I've had a lot of downs. I wouldn't change anything for it. I think um, my injury that I had uh, has probably turned me into a better person. It's made me how open my eyes, if you want to call it yeah, that, yeah. Um, rather than lose, lose uh, sight. Yeah, no, tell me more about that. Um, what was wrong with you beforehand? Look, I think I, think I, I used to see things my way a lot. Uh, instead, of, instead of looking at maybe other guys and saying, this, you know, there, there are different ways to, to do it. Mm. I, I was always you know, probably a little hot-headed Eastern Cape boy. Single-minded. Single-minded. Pig-headed. Where I thought, okay... <laughs> I know that I'm giving 100% here yeah, and this is the way that I give 100% and then maybe saw someone doing it a different way and I said, no, well, he's not doing it the same way as me so he's not giving 100%. I think that's where my friendship with Jacques Callis was very important yeah. because we are actually, we're good mates but we're completely different um, and no one could ever say that Jacques wasn't giving 100%. So yeah. he taught me that, a guy like Hashim Amla, just not chatting to him but just the way that he was as a person, he taught me that as well. Um, the, the big thing for me and I now I've, written in my book about it as well the bubble my bubble burst when when i had my injury um and you know in the sporting world whether it's right or wrong uh, we create a little bubble uh, around ourselves and we live in that bubble and we sometimes we we don't allow family into that bubble we push mates away mm. um and then all of a sudden my bubble was burst and i was no longer a cricketer i had to retire um and then all of a sudden i was like okay where are my family where are my friends and it made me realize that I'd been pushing all these guys and, and these family friends away from, my, from, away from me throughout my career, but now I needed them badly. And thankfully, um, you know, they were the better people than what I was and they were there for me. But it did make me realize that um, I think it's something that us as sportsmen, we sometimes get wrong. Sometimes it can be difficult because, you, you know, you've you got to try and look away from one or two little problems mm. that you have in your life in order to be focused on the field. Well, well uh, let me come in there because... You say that, and it's 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 incredibly honest of you. 
And yet, if you didn't have that single-mindedness stroke selfishness, if you didn't have that bubble, maybe you wouldn't have gone as far as you did. Well, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm yeah. saying sometimes that's what's required. I mean, I remember one or two teammates, um, you know, losing family members uh, just before a test match um, and, and also one-day games. And they're coming back and, and playing that game uh, and, and really performing well. You've got to be a little bit hard-headed to, to be able to do that and, and single-minded to be able to do that. I mean, can you imagine the sort of stress that you're going through thinking about having maybe lost your father or, or your mother or, yeah. or brother or sister and walking into the sporting arena with, with 100,000 Australians shouting at you and swearing at you? You know, you, you've got to create some sort of space around you to pr protect yourself. So. I, I don't know. I don't know. It, it needs, there needs to be a balance, though. That's, that's one thing I do know. Um, I know a lot of sportsmen have probably lost a lot of friends. I think we, we do become very selfish at times. Um, and it's just, yeah, you've you got to try and find a balance. I think Gary us. Kirsten called you a tough little shit. I mean, that's, that's a compliment in a way, isn't it? Yeah, I, I learned from the best. Yeah. He, he was also a tough little bugger. Eh? No, tell, he's, tell he us, was tough. But, but, because, I mean, there's so much to talk about. Inevitably, we're going to not cover everything. Yeah. But tell us about that under-19 squash final when you had the stress fracture. I found that incredible. Yeah, um, so the under-19, I mean, I, was always, I always thought that I was going to be a, a squash player, not a cricket player. Yeah. Unfortunately, there wasn't too much finance in the game of squash, so I ended up going, going for the, the cricketing side of things. But um, Alan Nestle, was that the guy? Alain Nestle, played? yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I actually, I only told my dad about five, six years ago because I told him that I'd had a stress, stress fracture from, from the game of cricket, diving. Um, but it was actually, I was on top of a roof and uh, we were having a couple of drinks and I managed to try act like Axel Rose and I jumped off. Uh, the top of the roof with a cricket bat and ended up landing on a washing line. And uh, I took a, a piece of my, my arm off, um, the bone on the, tip of the, on the tip of the elbow. And I didn't, well, I knew that I, I'd done something bad to it. Yeah. But I taped it up that night and I sort of went through and I said to my dad the next morning that I've, I've had a little bit of a problem on the cricket field. I was diving and I think I've, I've hurt it a bit. Uh, but we went for the operation and we had pins I had pins put in my arm and we, we, we sort of sorted that out. But the interprovincials that were, that were coming up, um, I didn't want to show a sign of weakness to anyone mm. um, because I knew that they would pounce on that. So I kept the whole thing quiet and I just sort of taped my arm up and I just said, no, it's a little bit of tennis elbow. But uh, there were actually pins in my arm throughout that whole tournament. Um, that, that hurts a bit. Thankfully, the doctors have given me quite a few painkillers. Um, I ended up losing the game to Elaine. But you were 2-0 down and got back to 2-all, didn't was two, you? Yeah, I was 2-0 two nil, two nil down, got back to 2-all, and uh, unfortunately lost the last uh, the last game in that match. 9-7, I think. Is that right? But yeah, so I, I, was, I was fighting a lot of demons in my own head um, about the injury, but also hoping that my dad didn't find out the real reason how I actually got injured. Yeah, your dad was obviously a hell of an, an influence, and he, he was tough as well. He was very tough for me, um, but it was something that I needed. And I think, um, you know, you can, be, you can be tough on people who whose attitudes and whose characters can ac accept that. Um, but then there's certain characters that you've got to be a little bit light on and a little bit weaker to. Um, you know, a guy that needs maybe a pat in the back. I think in the, in the beginning of my cricketing career, Hansi Crenier worked that out for me very quickly. Um, I remember dropping a catch um, against Nasser Hussain of Alan Donald's bowling. Yeah. And I always played on TV and it irritates me. <laughs> but uh, I learned a lot from that. But I mean... Well, I, t t tell us what happened. Because you, you were, what, down on yourself, sulking a bit. He, and you thought Hansi was going to put his arm around yeah, you. Yeah. So, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd actually kept very well. And then the one catch that was a dolly, I ended up dropping. Um, and I felt sorry for myself. Well, I didn't feel sorry for myself. I was quite hard on myself. And... Uh, Alan Donald was shouting and screaming. He actually came up to me after the end of the over and he patted me back and said, come boy, we need you here. Mm. Uh, and then I saw Hansi walking in from cover and I thought, okay, he's going to do the same. And he just grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and he, he shook me and he said, listen, you know, stop sulking. There's no place to hide you. We need you. South Africa needs you. Wake up and start keeping properly. <laughs> and uh, that was the, the best the best thing that's ever happened to me in my career, because I, straight away I knew that there was no place to hide in international sport. Yeah. Um, and, and if I made a, a mess up on the field, I needed to take responsibility for it. And whenever after that, if I had a dropped a catch or something like that, and I saw one or two guys walking towards me, I'd just say, get away from me. I know what I've done, and I'm going to try to rectify it. And, and, and John T was also very helpful at one stage, wasn't it, when you were having a bad tour? Was it Sri Lanka? Uh, it was in the West Indies. West Indies, West, West Indies. Indies. And yeah. John T actually came at me and he, he said to me, listen, you're putting in a, enough work here. You, unfortunately, the runs are just not coming for you. 
stop focusing on yourself, focus on the team scoreboard and see what you can do for the team rather than yourself. And I went out and I, I, I tried to do that. And all of a sudden I got to 20 and I walked off the field and I think it was a lunch break. And he said to me, okay, fine. Our score was on 310. Uh, you need to try to get us to 380. So I said, okay, fine, not a problem. And I went out there and ended up getting another 30 runs. Next minute I was on 50. And then all of a sudden I felt like I was in, I was in great form now. Um, and as soon as I got to 50, I was like, okay, now I can relax. And then I got out. Right. And I walked to the field and he said to me, he said, you got to 50 batting for the team, but you got out because you looked at your own individual score. And that was a big lesson for me as well. And, and something that I learned throughout my career as well is sometimes, you know, when you, when you look at your, your individual score and you, you try to perform for yourself as an individual, you put more pressure on yourself instead of actually performing for the team. And I know cricket, cricket is, is, is an individual sport, but it's, also a team sport. It's a unique sport it in is, a way, it, isn't it? it? Yeah. It's, it's not golf where you got to play for yourself um, and it's not rugby where... Totally the team. Totally the team. But, it, you know, you got to face the music when you're out there as an individual, but you're performing for a team as well. And I thought that was a, a massive lesson that, that John T. taught me. Tell us the other story about <laughs> one of my favorite people, Pat Simcox. I mean, it was one of your early, early tests at the Wanderers. You're facing Shoab Akhtar coming in at a million miles an hour. And I mean, describe what happened because it's it's one of the funniest insights into any sport I think I've ever had. Because you were a baby, weren't you? I was a baby then. Um, it was my first ever Test match in South Africa, uh, playing against Pakistan. We had Waka Yunus, uh, we had Wazim Akram, we had this youngster Shaib Akhtar who was very very quick at that stage. He was a bit wild as well. Yeah. And we got ourselves into a little bit of trouble, and I walked out to to bat with Sima and. Uh, Simo was on a and Simo was what late late thirties. Yeah, he, he was, was one of the seniors. He eh? was old. He was old. Old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, so I walked out and I actually enjoyed Simo. We got on very well. Uh, he always used to abuse me a bit, but in in good humour as well. So I walked out there and now I faced my first couple of balls. Obviously, I'm very nervous. And Simo is facing a couple of balls, and we was, we start getting a little partnership going. And then um, I can't remember who the captain was, but he said to uh, Shabak to warm up, and Shabak to warmed up, and the next minute he was running in. Um, kicking off the side screen and he was bowling short and he was bowling quick and Adam, was, Adam Bacher said he'd never seen anything like this yeah, I mean, he when, simply couldn't see the ball when he turned around to walk back to his mark he's, you could actually see marks on his, on his bum from his boots hitting his, his ass the whole time so <laughs> those legs were pumping Yeah, and somehow myself we, you know, I got down to the end and I played one or two uh, I got out the way one or two uh, bounces and I got one off my hips and um I, 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 Simmer got on to strike at the end of the over Simmer comes up to me and says Bouch we've got to make a plan here we can really really upset these guys if you have a look at and see how far the wicket keeper Moyen Khan is standing every time he bounces me we can actually run a single here it's a great way to rotate the strike but also for, for us to not not let them get settled yeah. um, in bowling to one batter uh, and also we can put runs on the scoreboard so I thought gee great experience by Simmer and yes he is standing very far back at the Wanderers so that's what we're going to do. The next over, get down there and Simmer. First ball, gets a Yorker, he manages to dig it out. Next ball, bumper. Simmer ducks and we take off for a run. And we made it easily. And Simmer looked at me from the other end and he put the thumbs up and he said, Bouch, that's great, great cricket, well done. Now, we, now we're thinking, now we're thinking, we're building a partnership. Well, anyway, Shabakta turns around now, now he's really upset because we've now taken a bar. It's an, almost an insult, isn't and it? And yeah. he runs in and I can see those flaps from his hair. <laughs> And he runs in and he bowls one of the quickest bounces I've ever faced. So I duck underneath it and I take off for a run. As I take off, I look at Simmer. Simmer just turned his back on me. So I'm thinking, what's going on here now? And now all the Pakistani guys are saying, oh, you're out, you're out here on your own. Yeah. That, you know? And I walk to, to Simmer after I face the ball. I say, Simmer, what's going on? So he says, Bouch, in the interest of the game, I think it's probably better that you face him rather than me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I learned that you can't buy experience in a supermarket. Yeah. <laughs> but tell us about the, 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 the comments that he made, that Simo made, because he was a great chirper, wasn't he? At the Pakistan. And of course, he went on to make a century and you had this famous stand. Yeah, look, look, I think um, a lot of the comments that Simo used to make, I can't actually repeat, <laughs> especially on, yeah. But, oh. um, you know, there were a couple of great ones. I remember Simo when I first made my debut uh, in Shakerpura in Pakistan. Um, a place Dave, no one had ever heard Dave, of and you'd travelled for 36 yeah, hours Dave, Dave Richardson had actually um, said just before the game that his cough he had pulled a cough muscle so 
as I walked out, now I'm shaking like a leaf and Simma comes up to me. I'm thinking that he's going to pat me on the back as well. And he just said to me, Bouch, don't cock it up. <laughs> and I sort of looked at him and I was like, okay, well, that's how my, my relationship with Pat Simcock started. But I, I knew it came in from a good place. And, and today, I think the guys still stay, say that in the dressing room because it's something that myself and Jacques sort of carried on yeah. throughout the generations. So when there's a, a youngster coming in for his debut game, I think guys always look at him and say, don't cock it up. Don't cock it up. I think it sort of calms you down a bit because it's, it's done in a good way as well. No, funny. Were you ever actually scared facing fast bowling? I mean, physically scared? Um, I was scared facing Shybuck to the one year uh, in a one-day game. Um, we had just beamed Jacques mm. um, and hit him on the back. Uh, I think he, he had bowl, bowled another beamer to another guy. Deliberate or, or accidental? Well, we'll never know. Um, yeah. And so he, he bowled two beamers in the space of two overs. Uh, and then Jacques got out, bowled middle stump out the ground. And, and uh, I had to walk to the crease. And obviously, the first thing that you're thinking is just watch out for the beamer. And you know, forget the bouncer. You, you sort of know how to face a bouncer. Yeah. But a beamer at that, that pace can kill you. Um, and so it wasn't nice facing him then, uh, especially running and bowling close to 100 miles an hour. How tough does it get out there? I mean, I know it's been in the it's been in the the the, the public eye a lot with the you know David Warner and and Quinny and so on. But but you 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 loved it. You were in there, weren't you? Yeah, I think I think the game has changed though. We got to understand that um, you can't say certain things to players nowadays. Although I do think that, that things still get said. Yeah. Um, I think it's one of those you got to you got to give and you got to be able to take. Um, and if who you, are the worst, the Aussies? Yeah, the Aussies are, are bad. Um, I'll say bad. I mean, in, in our year, they used to give it to us. We used to take it. Well, give it. us examples. Give us examples. When you came to the wicket, what happened? I think a lot of us... Bear in mind, they turn off the stumps. This is the side of the game we, we have no idea about. Yeah, look, I think they try and just make you feel like you're not good enough to be out there with them. Um, and it's worked out, isn't it? They've yeah, planned I it. I remember going to the crease and you got Matthew Hayden and Shane Warne standing in the slips and uh, Stuart Clark was bowling a ball at me. And he got one to jag back at Newlands and it hit me right in, in the box. Yeah. And um, the lower stomach is my granddad. Used I went to down, say. I went down and they all came up to me and they looked at me and I said, Bouch, you don't you don't look good, yeah. Maybe you should go off. And I said to him, No, no, I'm gonna stay on, trying to act all hard. Yeah. The next ball they bowled, one went the other way and went past the outside edge. And I'll never forget Shane Warne. He just took took a little stroll up to the wickets and he just said, Bouch, you're embarrassing yourself, yeah, champ. I think you should get off. <laughs> then the next ball hit me straight on the badge because I was trying to cover the, the good length outside of stump yeah, and yeah. he hit me with a bumper and it hit me straight on the badge. And then all of them were, you know, sort of got around me and they just said, you're actually embarrassing yourself here. Maybe this could be your last test match that you ever play because uh, everyone's watching this. And so they just try and... They try and uh, but that would get you. I mean, that would get you because let's be honest, inside all of us, there is that slight imposter syndrome that says, I'm lucky to be here. I'm going to get found out one day. And that's playing on that, isn't it? I think I think I'd played against them enough to understand that, uh, especially a guy like Shane Warne, um, you know, I actually get on very well with now. Yeah. Um, he He's a type of guy who, who runs the circus. And if you understand that he's an entertainer and he's there to entertain, then you don't really have to let anything that he says get to you. Um, and I often used to say to him, if he's bowling at me, you know, he, he always used to say, uh, who do I put my bunny ears on now? Uh, referring to a couple of players in the past that, that Darryl, he's had. Daryl, we're hoping you're listening to Daryl. He, he's had the wool over. Yeah. But I think, um, you know, I, I just said, it, I said to him straight, you know, if you can put bunny ears on me, then you know, thank you very much. Because I actually feel, if you're going to compare me to those sort of players, then I feel a lot better about being here. So you do talk back. Yeah, I talk back. Because some people say you don't, you keep quiet. Some it's guys talk back, yeah. some guys talk back, some guys don't, it, it, whatever, whatever you know, floats your boat. I mean, sometimes I used to find that if I used to talk back, um, I used to I used to become a better player because um, mm. I wasn't too focused about my technique. I was just focused on watching the ball. Um, there were times in, in games where where we used to actually try to talk to bowlers to put mm. them under a bit of pressure. Uh, so, Like what? Give us examples. Um, we were in, in India and um, Morelli Kartik was, was bowling. Good uh, with, bowler. With Anil Kumble. Sure. But he was a youngster. Yeah, yeah. And we were chasing about 170, I think. And uh, we got off this to... This is in Mumbai. In Mumbai. I we got off to it. an absolute flyer. Uh, then we started losing a couple of wickets. And as, as people know in India, when the runs dry up, then they already dry up. And the ball's starting to stop a bit. And I actually walked out with Jacques. And Jacques had been there for quite some time. And I said to him... If, if I don't do something here, play shots or say something to someone, I think I'm, I'm going to get out. Mm. So I might as well try something. 
And Jacques said, well, what about this youngster? Let's try and get get stuck into him a bit. And that's when we started talking to him and just said, you know, we're not going to score anything off Kumble, but we're going to score for you because you're the weak link in this whole Indian side. Yeah. And I remember him dropping one short and and Jacques pulled one into um, Sachin Dendulkar's shin pad who was standing at short leg. And I walked over to him and I just started tapping the mark and I, I sort of looked at him out the corner of my eye and I said to him, I told you, you're going to lose this game for your country within the next 20 minutes. And he fell apart. Eh? He bowled full tosses and I think within the next... 20 minutes, we had won the game. And did the Indians pick this up? And is there almost like a... No, we were clever. We didn't say it too loud, but we were yeah. whispering to him. Yeah, yeah. And you could see that he was he was, he was was wanting to bite, but it's not in his sort of demeanor to to have a go back. Um, but uh, you could see it was getting to him because as soon as he, he bowled one bad ball, then we were into his space. I think so, you got 27 that day, yeah. didn't you? And you, you won the test. Yeah, Jacques, Jacques batted really well throughout yeah, the whole game yeah. as well. So yeah, we ended up winning the test match. But I think that's that's not sort of abuse. That's just trying to be clever and get into a guy's space and put him under a bit of pressure. And, and I often felt that if I'm under pressure, then why not try take the pressure off myself and put it onto someone else? And would you go to him afterwards and say, hey, no hard feelings, guys? 100%. Whatever. Yeah, we, we, especially with Morelli. I'm very good mates with him. So we we often joke about that particular game and say we were both lighties at that stage. And, yeah, yeah. And we have a beer around it. And, uh, you know, there's, there's been some great stories. Even like a guy like Kevin Peterson. Yeah. Uh, that, that moment that he was at, uh, was it, Edgbaston? He was on 94. Um, and... Or 98 or 96 or 98, I think around about there. And uh, I told A.B. de Villiers to come up uh, from from Long On. And I just said to KP, I said, KP, you've got it so well. And this crowd's just waiting for you to run down and hit Harrow of his head for six. <laughs> Go for it. You deserve it. And then we'll just bring the, we'll put the field back out again and then we can start playing again. And he blocked the first ball. And as he blocked the first ball, I said to him, now, come on, man, take your skirt off, you know, and and KP is a good friend of mine as well. And, <laughs> and then the other guy started niggling a bit. And yeah, long story short, he ended up holding out to 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 AB at <laughs> Madon, trying to hit it all over the top. So, you know, little things like that. It's not only about harsh abuse. It's yeah, about being yeah. smart as well. There's certain guys that you don't talk to. There's certain guys that you can't talk to. But where's the line? The Aussies talked about the line and they seem to want to set it. And in fact, I remember in the one series, you were quoted as saying that, we had a few drinks with them afterwards, but we didn't really want to. It was just because of it. So that they'd obviously cross, cross the line. Why, where, where is that line? Well, I don't know where the line is, to be honest with you. I think. But you do, because you've told us what was acceptable before. And now, you know, that, that and you've also suggested that sometimes it's unacceptable. Well, where, I, where is the well, line? Well, I think that what is acceptable in yesteryears is, might not be acceptable today. Um, and also, if... If Australians say something, and there was a lot of harsh words that got said, um, a lot worse than what you hear about today. Yeah. Um, and so we thought that that is the line. Um, Would that be personal? Would that be about families? Would that be yeah. about appearance? Would it be yeah. about colour? Um, well, not not amongst the players about colour, but yeah. certainly the, the the sort of fans and the, yeah. the spectators. Because I've heard Australia is the most yeah. racist place to yeah. play. Yeah, Mackay and Tini got, um, he got a lot of stick there. Um, and... I think that's where the RCC sort of said, okay, fine, we, we need yeah. to put um, a lot of rules and regulations around the stadiums. But certainly players talking about uh, relationships and all that type of stuff, yeah. that certainly did come up. But I, when, when the Aussies were, yeah, the reason why I got stuck in a bit on, on social media was that, you know, they've got players who had played in yesteryears um, and now all of a sudden they're the ones who determine where that line is. And then mm. our guys react on that same line and then they say, no, it's, they've crossed the line. So... No, Hypo- hypocrisy. Exactly. And especially coming from certain players who are always there in the thick and thing, the thick and thin of things. And I just think that, uh, yeah, it is. Uh, one or two of them were being hypocritical. Tell us about that amazing catch you got, Sachin Tendulkar, off, I think it was with Mackay and Tini, was it? Tell us about that diving catch. It was voted one of the best catches of all time. I think the only reason it was but one of the best because it was to, to Sachin Tendulkar. Well, and you, what better and probably reason? Got a, you probably got a lot of Indians voting there. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, it was one of those ones where, you know, Mackay, it was always a, a nice guy to keep to. Yeah. Um, he always kept me on my toes. He had the odd ball that went down the side. <laughs> and we were also very good mates. So, you know, for him to, to nick Tendulkar off and uh, me to dive to my right and, and take a nice catch uh, is always well, nice. But how, how does that happen? Because is it pure instinct? You, there can't be any thought process because it happens so quickly. I, I think it's just instinct and a lot of training, training yeah. muscle memory. Uh, it's the same as a as a batter, top top line batter coming out and facing a quick bowler. Um, you, you practice for that sort of thing. 
Uh, and a lot of guys say, oh, this guy's got a lot more time than another guy. Um, I think the world's best batsmen and world's best fielders probably look like they have got a little bit more time. Yeah. But maybe that's the training of, of that sort of intensity, facing a lot of quick bowling and nets um, and having... It look, might look like they got more time, but it's just a repetitiveness of, of facing that do, intensity. Do, how much do you know what the bowler is going to bowl? I mean, we know in baseball, the the, the guy that's behind, the wicketkeeper in baseball, whatever they call him, and he gives the fingers and he basically calls what the bowler is going to bowl. To what extent do you know every ball, what's coming? I think um, I know exactly what the guy's plan is. Um so if, if you get a guy like Dale Stan, you know that he, when he's running in, he wants to try to shape the ball away. Yeah. Um, so you could sort of stand a little, bit to, a little bit closer towards your slips and you can push your slips out a bit. Uh, once the ball gets a bit older, then you know that he wants to bring the ball back in and, and, and reverse the ball, which means that you've got to go a bit tighter uh, on the line of the stumps. So I and think what about a short? What about a bumper? You won't, you won't know that. I mean, we might know that uh, he wants to do it every now and again. So... Uh, you, you make your body aware of it. So when you see it in his action, and there is certain things that I can pick up with, with our bowler's actions when they're running in. Um, like I know when a guy wants to bowl a bouncer, he might run in just a little bit quicker. Yeah. But because I've seen it a lot, um, I can pick it up. A batter probably won't be able to pick that up. Um, also, you know, spinners. Um, I, I'll have chatted to spinners and I know what line that the spin, that I want the spinner to bowl because I can pick up one or two little technical de- defaults in a, in a batter's yeah. stance or in his technique. So, And is that an ongoing process? Because obviously you've got to take into account the weather, you've got to take into account the pitch and you've got to take into account the ball. Those are all changing all the time. So are you constantly watching and constantly having this dialogue? I think that's one of the jobs as a wicket keeper. You need to be the guy who, you're at the best view in the in the stadium. So you need to be the guy to tell the captain, is the ball swinging? So if the ball's not swinging, you need field changing. Uh, if the ball's not swinging, then maybe we need to bowl straighter so we don't create too much width and all that type of stuff. So I think as a wicketkeeper, I was always involved in the game. So I was mm. naturally always thinking how to get a batsman out or to how to draw the runs up. So so yes, I think it's something that, that I always chatted to the bowlers about and gave them my input of what I thought. So I sort of knew what they were trying to do the whole time. Fascinating. And of course, you were a reluctant Wicket keeper, wasn't it? Richard Pybus as a as a lighter, you were a, you were an off spinner, and he, he made you take the wickets, and then you went home to your dad and complained. Yeah, I, I didn't enjoy the the wicket keeping at first. Um, to be <laughs> honest, I enjoyed bowling. I always thought thought I was going to be a, a, a fast seamer. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, my heart didn't allow me for that. <laughs> yeah. Then he turned me into an off spinner, and then eventually, uh, I, I think uh, he just decided, no, maybe he's too he's too mouthy and he's he's too energetic. He needs to get behind the stumps. Thankfully, he made the right call. And when did you when did you embrace it? Um, I started wiki keeping uh, in my standard eight years. So what's that? Grade ten. Grade ten. I started uh, keep keeping wickets. Yeah, and a bit of, when I say embrace it, you were reluctant at first. When did you say, I'm actually enjoying this, I'm good at it, I can have a career at this? I think uh, once I got chosen for the, the board of schools team, yeah. um, that's when I sort of said, okay, well, maybe there is a career for me, yeah. Um, and then, then I actually started enjoying it. Um, and, and was it always a professional career you wanted? Like I said in the beginning, you know, I, was, I always thought I was going to be a squash player. Um, yeah. I was probably a better squash player than what I, what I was cricketer. Um, and then, but it was always sport. I mean, there was never a, a, no, my, my a university dad, education, my, a profession. My dad knew. My mother wished that I was going to be academic, but my dad yeah. always knew that I was going to be a sportsman. He always used to argue with my, with my mom, saying to her, "Listen, let him play sport. He's always going to be a sportsman. He's not going to be the academic. He gets bored in, in the in the office in the classroom." So, I, I loved the outdoors. I really enjoyed the outdoors and 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 being on a field, kicking balls with my dad and him throwing balls at me. So and a great school, Selborne, eh? Yeah, it is a very good school. And and did you ever consider I might not make it? I think it is always a, a consideration that goes through your mind once you making the transition from school into varsity. Yeah. Um, I, I had a very good uh, under nineteen tour to to England and to India, uh, and then I got selected for the national academy. And the national academy in those years was. Almost like you, your future is now planned. Who done that? You. Was that after Clive Rice? That was Clive Rice and Hilton Ackerman. Jeez. So, Whiz. I mean, that's like a master class. And we it? were in, in among some great names at the academy as well. And I got selected for that. And I think that's when not only me, but my family realized, okay, the game of cricket is something that we're going to have to look forward, look forward to in the future. And hopefully, you know, you can succeed in it. 
Tell us about the, the famous 438 game, because it's almost as though people have forgotten your 50 with with Herschel and Graham Smith and so on. I mean, f- first of all, what was it like when the Aussies were batting? Entertaining. <laughs> I must admit, it was quite nice to watch from the back. Um, yeah, you had the best view, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Ricky Ponting's knock that he played was spectacular. Um, look, we knew the wicket was very good. Yeah. And we knew that the boundaries were quite small and the ball was flying. But it wasn't like the balls were just flying just over the boundary rope. They were flying to all parts of, yeah, of the, yeah. the bigger part of the stadium. So, you know, we knew we were under pressure. Um, the, the, the series, where a lot of people forget, the series is actually too all. So it was a, fi- that. It was yeah. a final, wow. ga- final game. Yeah. So there was a lot, lot of pressure from the series point of view as well. And it'd been a fantastic series. We, had, we thought that we should have won in Durban. We had just missed out in Durban. And then obviously going to the ball ring was going to be a massive game. In the morning we woke up, uh, you know, we were obviously a little bit nervous because it was a final for us. Um, and they batted and there was lots of laughs and that after that come for field. I remember Vinnie Barnes and, and Andrew Simons having a bit of a dig at each other um, <laughs> when they're walking off. But uh, they really had thought, okay, that's game set a match. And yeah. to be honest with you, uh, without, without jokes aside, I probably think 90, 99.9% of us in our dressing room thought that that is game set as a match as well. Uh, a lot of the people started leaving the stadium. Yeah. And uh, we sort of got ourselves into position. Well, Graham um, Smith had a magnificent knock. Graham and Herschel played on yeah. evil knocks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we got ourselves into position where, you know, I remember myself and Justin Kemp going into the into the lookout um, room in the change room and saying, guys, we've actually won the game from here before against the West Indies. I was going to say, when was the moment you thought you had a chance? I think, I think it was probably in the 30th over um, where we had chased down close to 200... Uh, because they always say you can double after 30, don't yes. they? And we, we had chased a, a game against the West Indies um, recently. Well, just before that. Yeah. Um, where we had batted really well and scored over 220 overs. And we knew it was possible, especially on that wicket at that ground. And do you think the Aussies thought as well for the first time, hang on a second, Look, this I, could go horribly wrong? I always, you you know, when, you, when you're defending a total like that, you, you always go, okay, well, if they get off to a good start, then we're under a bit of pressure. But they always thought that, you know, Two wickets. They're losing a couple of wickets here and we all get stuck into them. There was a little stage where myself and Jacques batted together where we just had to try and steady the ship a bit mm. and take it back down to a sane level because it was all insanity <laughs> before that. And a lot of people were probably, okay, well, I remember watching a DVD where one or two of the commentators are saying, yeah, they're losing, losing uh, the game for their side now. With all due respect, how do they know how to chase down 434? <laughs> no one had ever done it before. So we were also, it was a new new territory for us as well. So do you listen to the commentary on in, in the... I, I think because it was a DVD made of the whole game, yeah. we, we've we watched the DVD. But I mean, normally you'd have the television inside, but do people listen to commentary? No, not the commentary. We turn yeah. the commentary on, onto silent. Uh, we'll just watch the, the game and the reviews and all that type yeah. of stuff. Um, so yeah, we, we get we get close, and I think the heroes of the day, the unsung heroes of the day, um, were the Roger Telemachus, uh, yeah. the Jan van der Watt, those guys coming in. People forget they even played. Yeah. They played unbelievable knocks, and even a guy like Andrew Hall. Um, you know, they, they came in, they hit boundaries at great times. My job from from Mickey Arthur was to just stay there and make sure I was there at the end. At the end, and yeah. try to stabilize all innings. And if I was there at the end, then we got a chance of winning. Talk us through the last over. The last over. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I've, got, I've got goosebumps. I remember hitting my, the goosebumps. first ball. I hit so sweet and it hit Brett Who, Lee. Who's bowling? Brett Lee. Brett Lee, yeah. And it hit oh. Brett Lee on the ankle. And I actually thought I broke his ankle. I was more worried about the fact that the ball only went for one instead of going to the boundary for four because it would have gone for the bo- yeah. would have gone to the boundary and then the game would have been close to dead and buried. Um, and then Andrew Hall got on strike and, and myself and Hawley had a bit of a conversation and I said to him, look here, we've come all this way. We've batted... Without any, anyone blocking our, our style and that, you know, just be nice and positive. If we can keep the ball on the ground, then keep the ball on the ground. And then, uh, you know, Hawley hit the, the next ball for four. Yeah. Um, and then he got out trying to do the same thing, uh, unfortunately. And I, now Makai and Tini walks to the wicket. And I remember walking up to Makai. <laughs> so him everybody over. in that stadium just thought, oh my goodness, yeah. no. Yeah. And I remember Makai walking to the crease and I went and met him halfway at the square leg umpire. And uh, like I said, Mackie and myself have been very close mates for a long, long time throughout our whole career. And it's the first time I've ever seen Mackay and Tini turn white. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, he was shaking his bat. And yeah, yeah. eventually I just said, oh, Mackie, um, Get this, your bat on this, it. this big back lift that you usually got, he's definitely going to try by an in-swing Yorker. Uh, just, just watch the ball. 
uh, try keep your bat nice and low and just watch me. Uh, if I run, then you run. And you must understand, you know, I was unfortunate to be a part of that, that team where, where we, we drew in the semi-final of the World Cup. Of course. Uh, with with Lance Kluzner and Alan Donald. So, Edgbison, was it? Yeah, yeah. Where they had that, they, they had that uh, mishap with the run, running between wickets. And that was going through my mind as well. So I just said to him, I said, Mac, you just watch me. If I run, you run, you sprint and you dive. So he said, okay, fine, that's not a problem. Whether you you heard anything I was saying, I'm not I'm not 100 sure. But he managed to dig out. How uh, anybody could hear anything? The noise was. He managed so loud. to dig out a uh, uh, in swinging York and and steer it down to th- third man, which is probably the best shot of his life. Mm. And uh, I remember him running past me and shouting and screaming, going, "Yeah, cheering!" And I was cheering as well. And I get down to other end, and I was like, "Okay, Mark, let's focus here now because I'm the only one who can mess this whole game up for this entire crowd." <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, it's amazing how time slows down. Brett Lee ran in uh, the next ball, and I was just thinking to myself, you know, the same thing as what I t- what I told Hawley. Um, we batted so positively the whole game. Why now go into my shell? Yeah. Uh, and I said, if it's up, it's going. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the rest was history, and it it, it was a fantastic game. You know, afterwards as well, um, you know, we're walking around and to see people with tears in their eyes, and I'd always looked at. At the, the Rugby World Cup, um, how, how people, our sport can unite a nation. Yeah. And that is my little my little piece. You know, I've, I walked and I saw this, these guys crying and I thought to myself, geez, I've done, our, our team has done something special here. I was just lucky enough to close it off. Absolutely. And, and you go past that, that, little, that little plaque at the Wanderers now commemorating yeah. the greatest one day game ever. And it it's, was. And it, that is something that I'll forever, you know, hold in my, my good memory book um, as, as walking around the field and seeing these guys crying and, and hugging each other. Uh, and that to me is something more special than the actual game. Isn't that fun? I remember Ricky Ponting also giving up his joint man of the match yeah. award. And I spoke to him at the Laureus in, in Portugal. And I said, well done. He says, you know, there was no, it was the, one of the best innings I've ever played, but there was no contest. It, yeah. it wasn't a big deal. That was big of him. Yeah, very much so. I mean, Ricky, Ricky, the, that's a, a lot of people get the Australians wrong, especially the Australians of, of yesteryear. Yeah. Um, those guys, they were, they played really hard, but they were also the first to, to walk up to us after the game and say, wow, what a special game of cricket. And it's yeah. just a privilege to have played against you guys. Well done for the series win. Um, and we come and we come and have a drink because we want this game to go down as the greatest ever one day game. That's the way it should be. And yeah, we want to be yeah. known to to come have a drink after afterwards with you. As from well. from from that wonderful memory, King Commission persuading Herschel Gibbs to tell the truth. Tell us about that. Um, yeah, there was a tough time in I think South African cricket's history. Um, I remember going to to Herschel and I was very close to Herschel as well and, and sat with him. And uh, I could and see he was that, a youngster. Of I could see there was something bothering him, um, and he said to me, "Come, let's." Because our, our agent Donna Cummins, we had the same agent, so he said to me, "Come, let's go for let's go for a drink." So I said to him, "Okay, fine, not a problem. Let's go." And this was about nine o'clock in the morning, and we went to a, a little little pub around the corner from from town in in Cape Town, and uh, he looked at me, and I could see something wasn't right. So I said, uh, "Come, Hirsch, come clean with me. What's what's going on, bud?" And uh, he said, okay, can I get two double Jack Daniels and Coke? <laughs> so I said, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, here we go. double, yeah. So I said, okay, fine, I'll have one with you. And then yeah, then he just, yeah, he basically broke down. He just said to me, okay, fine, this is what happened. And I mean, I didn't know what to do. Um, so the first thing I did was was phone my agent, Donna, and I said to her, um, you know, what do you want us to do? And then that's when they phoned the lawyers. And I, th- I think the lawyers came in as well and Herschel told everything. Uh, that that happened uh, from his side because obviously you were scared that if he told the truth he might get banned for life yeah well put in jail that's the first thing i said to him i said you know hershey uh, i know that there's something bothering you but you must understand that you know you got a career as well and uh, you, you need to you need to come clean otherwise you could go to jail and we don't know the law i mm. mean we that's that had just been told to us that if we don't come clean we're going to jail and i didn't want Herschel to go to jail and then he came out and, and he, you know, he told everyone uh, what, what had happened from his side. And it wasn't a nice thing to, to have to go through um, as youngsters sitting in a, in a big courtroom. I mean, With I was the world sh- watching. shaking. Yeah, shaking. I think all of us were shaking. I remember the, the one lady was questioning me over what pasta was offered to us or that, that we offered to Hansi that particular evening. Um, and I felt guilty telling her what pasta we actually were giving what, to. Why was that a quote? What was that all about? They asked us if uh, we had ever been approached by him. Yeah. And um, Had you? Well, 
in a very light-hearted way. Um, this we, was the one I've received this offer, guys. So, Look, so we I'm were, it, it was myself, you. Jacques, and, and Lance Klusner were in a room, um, and we were making pasta, and there was we over, overcooked the pasta. Uh, so we had a lot more pasta in the, in the bowl, and we just sent a message uh, to a couple of guys saying, this, you know, if we want some food, we got food in our room in India. And he came through, and, uh, and he had a bowl of food, and then he, he lightheartedly said, yes, I've been offered this uh, to, to um, change the game a bit. And uh, we started laughing and said, yeah, whatever. And I think that's when he just went, no, okay, well, these guys are not interested. Um, but we obviously had to say that in court. Yeah. And then the lady started questioning me about what pasta it was. I mean, who cares what pasta it was? We're telling you the story about how we heard it. And, um, and I mean, she looking, made us feel guilty about something. Looking back now, I mean, people say if you analyze Hansi's talent versus his record, you can see from the moment of his first approach that his batting wasn't as good as it should have been. Looking back, should you have noticed more? No, I don't think so. Um, I don't know. I haven't been through his stats and when he was approached and all that type of stuff. So I, I, mm. I can't even agree with that because I'm not sure. Mm. Um, I, I held Hansi in, in very high regard. And, you know, the, till the well, day... you told the story about what he, what he did for you. Did, did you never suspect anything? I never suspected anything, no. And not you were never all, approached all. yourself or in I was never, never approached, never yeah. approached. So Thoughts what was, what was your reaction day. when it all came out? Disappointed. Um, I remember being in a meeting, a uh, team meeting with um, with him. And when he said, no, listen, guys, I'm clean. And we all said, we back you 100%. Um, and then a couple of hours later, we got a message from our manager saying that, you know, Ansi's left. And uh, he's just made an apology that uh, unfortunately he had been involved in a couple of things. And it was, it was very tough as a team, but I think as a team, we pulled together and uh, we realized that we had a job to do for, to try and get the game of cricket back, back into mm. order in, in South Africa. So did you ever see him again? Did you talk to him again? Yeah, quite a few times. Um, did you ever discuss it? I didn't want to discuss it with him. Um, mm. I didn't need to discuss it with him. I remember seeing him at, at fan court um, and he invited us to his house for a drink. And uh, as we walked in, I remember Bata being there as well, and she walked. She obviously knew that this is going to be quite a tough little time, and he he burst into tears. Um, myself and Jacques walked over to him. We gave him a hug, and we said, "Listen, you don't have to. You don't have to say anything. I think we've you've been through enough as an individual, um, and we've been through enough as well. And we forgive you. And let's just you know, you got a life to live now." Do, do you think he was on his own? Because I noticed towards the end he was almost acting like a victim. Hansi was almost acting like a victim. And think, trying to think about it rationally, you say the only reason he could feel like a victim was if he knew other people had got away with it in South Africa who were there wearing the colors, etc. Do you, do, you, do you think there's more to it? There is more to it. Um, we've we've learned that there's more to it. Uh, there's an underground world, which we probably don't all understand about. Mm. Uh, the amount of money that gets put onto to bets per game um, is ridiculous. Um whether, whether I can say he's a victim or not, I'm not too sure. But there's one thing I do know is that he was made an example of. Mm. Uh, there are a lot of other guys that were involved um, that as players we know. South Africans? Not, as, not South Africans. Um, guys overseas. Yeah. And why they are protecting them, I don't know. Um, and there are quite a few players who, who um, have sort of picked up on, on scenarios in games where we know that it's actually happening or it had happened but yet they get protected and, and nothing happens to them. So yes, there is a, there's a lot of hurt inside of a lot of the South African players mm. looking at what Hansi went through um, and being made an example of. Not wrongfully, rightfully. Um, you know, he deserved to go through what he, what he went through because yeah. uh, he needed to get punished. But there are a lot of players that got away with murder. And, yeah. and that, that to, to a lot of us is, is not right. And, and something that we always question the anti-corruption union on. Yeah. I mean, have people got evidence? You say we know this, that, I mean, should you go forward with it and say, what about ABC? Well, I don't know if you've perhaps seen this this uh, new video on YouTube uh, that, that uh, Al Jazeera have made. No. About match fixing, um, where it brings up a, a lot of things and... I, I just don't understand how there hasn't been anything. I have, of course, that's right. Yeah, I, no, I have. I don't I understand how there's, it, yeah. there hasn't been anything more from it. Um, it Everything has just seemed to gone quiet. Yeah. And that's very disappointing, especially having been through what we went through. And this is, 
this is now after all international cricketers uh, and officials have been educated about everything. Yeah, no there's excuse. No, there's anymore. no excuse yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's no excuse to to not even say something when someone approaches you. Did anything ever happen in the IPL? Is the IPL fixed? John, I, I wouldn't know. Um, I, I hear stories. I'm not at the IPL anymore. I yeah. hear stories about that. Did you enjoy it? I, I really enjoyed the IPL. Yeah. Uh, IPL was 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 good fun. It was good hard cricket as well. Uh, great time to to get to know different players, yeah, different yeah, cultures yeah. as well. So I really enjoyed it. Whether there's match fixing going on the IPL, I wouldn't know. Um, that's that's something that you have to speak to anti corruption unit. Would I be surprised if it if it is going on? Not at all. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised. Like I said, um, so we, much money. We've we've now been educated to know how much money actually swaps hands uh, during games and. It's like crime, um, mm. you know, like run poaching in our country. Um, how do you stop it? Uh, well, 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 let's move that quickly because we're coming to the end now. You, you, you got involved with the, the rhino poaching. You, you love the bush, etc. T- t- tell us about that. Were you approached? Was it your initiative? How did that come about? Um, we actually went fishing in the Lower Sabi River with um, a couple of friends of ours who, who live at Skakuza and a guy by the name of uh, Frick Rousseau who heads up the private investigations unit. And we, we spent the whole day fishing, walking up and down the river. And we, obviously, you've got guns as well, mm. tiger fishing. And then uh, we, we put up tent next to the Lower Sabi um, in the middle of nowhere. And we actually bumped into these guys from the anti-poaching unit. And uh, they were obviously walking late at night, which to me was amazing that they mm. weren't scared, first of all, of the bush, being a, a young guy in the bush. And they came over to the fire. We offered them some food. We got them some food. Obviously, they weren't drinking. Mm. And um, I said, said to them, do you mind sitting down for five minutes and just tell me a couple of stories about what you guys go through every night, uh, being beanies on, on foot rangers. And they, they told us a couple of stories, and it was fascinating. And I got, you know, love, I love animals to bits, and I love the bush. And I got to a point where I said, I'll be. And uh, Jacques Rudolph, uh, who was sitting there with us, I said, come, boys, we've got to try to do something. Was now. this before or after the accident? This was before the accident. Before the accident. Before right. the accident. So I said, come boys, we've got to try to do something here. And Frick so actually mentioned to us that uh, SAB um, had been involved in, in doing quite a few things for conservation. So I said, well, that's our angle in because Castle Lager had sponsored cricket for, yeah, for how yeah, many years. Yeah. So I said, okay, that's the angle. So when, when I got back, um, I, f- I found a couple of guys from SAB, the guys that we'd been dealing with in the cricketing world. And they said, fantastic idea. Um, and how we were going to help them was to try and extract DNA from runners, mm. uh, get companies to try extract DNA from runners, and then buy a DNA machine. Um, so basically, you put all the runners on a database, so that if the horn gets found somewhere in the in the world um, through Interpol, they can actually connect the the, the the horn and the animal that's been poached. It was a scientist from Pretoria who actually Doc, discovered you could Doctor uh, Doctor Cindy them. Harper. That's yes. the one. Yeah. So we we actually spoke to Cindy and we asked Cindy what what she needed and she needed a new DNA machine. Um, so that is our first goal is to try and raise enough funds to to look after this DNA machine, which we eventually we got. Um, and then we started our organization. It started off with the South Africa uh, the SAB Boucher organization mm. and now it's moved to the Boucher legacy. Um, you know, unfortunately SAB have pulled out after their whole um, change Takeover, with, yeah. with, with AB InBev. Uh, but Alistair Hewitt is still very passionate about it. And uh, Great guy, he, he yeah. still heads it up with myself. Are you looking for sponsorship? Can you do with more sponsorship? Yeah, we, we're looking for guys to help us. I think that the whole, the whole thing that, that I thought really had a good ringtone to it was, you know, Castle and it, uh, it all comes together with a castle. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we wanted to try and pull all companies and companies it can be quite difficult at times because they all want their own piece of it. And they say, oh, we are doing this and we are doing that for it. And I'm saying guys for the better of our species and not only for rhinos, but for conservation, yeah. let's all just put our own little preferences into our pockets and all pull together and try to do something, go, all going, all the arrows going the right direction and do something that, that can really make a difference. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not really concerned uh, about different companies looking after their own little individual statuses. I want all of us to come together and, and try to do something that can really help. And, you know, I've had a lot of, I want to try to create a, a sort of concept where sport gets involved in conservation. That's why I yeah. pulled a lot of the South African cricket guys in. Uh, Kevin Peterson is yeah, massive brilliant. with me at yeah. the moment as well. We just had... A couple of uh, fantastic golfers join us as well, the birdies for Rana. Um, and I just do think that there's a massive gap in the market where we can all join together and do something for the good of conservation. Rana at the, at the moment is our major issue, but 
there's elephant down the line. There's wild dog. There's there's lion. And, and the other point, if I can come in, because some people might say, oh, lovely, but why are you looking after animals while there's people starving on the streets? But tourism is <clears throat> what is going to save this country's economy. And animals are so much a part of tourism. So it's it's not just about animals. It's people as well, isn't it? Well, that's 100%. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people ask me that same question. Mm. Okay. In the beginning part of my career, I was looking after young kids. Okay. And then I moved on to the conservation side. And a guy by the name of Norman Adamy, who used to look after yes, SOB, yeah. he actually sat me down when I got involved. And I sat down with Dr. Ian Player as well. And they explained to me the reasons why we need to have, we need, need to look after conservation and especially our wildlife. Wildlife has put South Africa on the map. And we got to understand that. We might not think it, that, 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 that that's the point. But um, tourism, like you say, is massive. Mm. If we lose one of our big five, then why would people want to come to South Africa? Okay. Absolutely. We we only we look after well, we don't look after. We are people who are protecting different species in our country. We don't own them. We don't custodians. own the Custodians. We're the custodians, we yes. Way, yeah. We're the custodians of all these animals. So it's our it's our job to look after them. And uh it's it's not only the people who live in the bush, it's not only their job, it's the job of the people of, of Africa and in particular yeah, yeah. South Africa. Well, we'll put, we'll put details up there. And, and, and look, we could go on talking for ages. There's lots we haven't covered, uh, Mark. A bit of advice, youngster out there, you know, thinking about a career in cricket. In cricket, What would your advice be briefly to that kid? Um, depending on the age. First of all, you've got to love the game. You've got to have a passion for the game. Um, as parents, I think it's very important for them not to, to overtrain. Mm. Um, I think let them have a bit of fun. Don't look too technical. I think once they get to the age of probably 15, 16, then they can start looking at technique. Um, but it's like anything, you know, if you don't enjoy the game, if you don't getting, enjoy getting out there, running around a field and, and hitting balls, then, then you're probably looking at the wrong sport for yourself. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, I always used to, I used to really enjoy playing it um, and having fun. I used to enjoy coming to, to cricket grounds. And, and running on the field and diving like John T. Rhodes used to yeah, do. And yeah. then the next day I'm playing in the same team as him. You know, got, got this side and, of it. And, and what about the money side of things? Are you good with money? Look, I think IPL has, has created a, a great yeah, window for, yeah. for international sportsmen. So the money side is, is really really getting looked after at the moment. Um, you know, the I think the cricket's probably the, most, the second most famous sport in the world um, mm. behind football. Uh, and that's that's stats that that because of India agree. particularly, yeah, because of India. And I I don't think the the finance. Part but if somebody game, doesn't get to the IPL, it's a different league, isn't it? Well, I think there's so many different leagues up and running now yeah. that I think the IPL was the start of the whole thing. Um, but now there's so many different leagues. Guys can make a, a proper earning from from just going around the world playing. The guys in can blow leagues. the money as well, eh? They can blow the money, and I think that's why it's important to prepare for the future. And uh, for, for me, that you know, I was very, I was very lucky that uh, I had a, a very good friend, uh, a motherly figure, and a, and an agent or manager in Donna Cummins who yeah. who taught me what it's all about, not to just go searching for that the top dollar, but to look after sponsors, um, and and look after your future and put money away now while well, I've got something right now don't go blow it on 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 toys put it away for for your 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 future of your family for your kids for your your schooling all that and, type and, of stuff and, and speaking about that you've got a, a big development coming up in November haven't you I have I've boy, got, boy or a girl I've got a little boy coming oh, coming in word. November so really looking forward to that <laughs> I think well I know it's going to be life-changing I've yeah. got all my mates uh, telling me how much uh, I'm going to change and but it's it's coming. Would you a, rather he was a cricketer or a lawyer? I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think a, a little golfer would really be be happy. Maybe he can be a very good golfer and take me to Augusta to play Augusta one day. Or wouldn't that be fabulous? Yeah, it would listen, be listen, Mark, it's been fabulous talking to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, John. I really appreciate it. Wasn't that fabulous? I would have liked to have spoken to Mark Boucher for hours. Absolutely fantastic. Thanks to Slow in the City for hosting us as usual. Follow us on social media at TSE Advisory. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your favorite app for updates. See you next time. Cheers from John Robbie.